Well, Shabbat Shalom. What a special morning, huh? Isn't that great? Congratulations again to Gene and Larry Glavick. The children did an amazing job. It's wonderful, isn't it? Well, this morning's message, I want to share with you a story. I'm going to tell a story. It's a story of a shepherd and a hireling, which is a hired worker, and a wolf. Those are our three characters today for our story. So it's a the steady sound of the Atlantic can be heard in the distance. Familiar sight in this part of the world. Although this paints a serene picture, there is a danger that is lurking. A killer is on the prowl, is an expert. He's an expert in stealth and is rarely seen. He is crafty. He is cunning, and he is covetous. How long it takes for the right moment. Now, ordinarily, sheep are no match for him, but somewhere in the herd, the ram, this predator will distance himself from him, striking the sheep from the shadows. And when the sheep graze, they slowly gravitate in one general direction. The predator's strategy is simple. He will attack the vulnerable. He will attack the vulnerable. The vulnerable that are on the outer edge of the flock, those that have unknowingly distanced themselves from the male ram or the shepherd. Suddenly the destroyer will lunge from the darkness and bite a young sheep on the backbone, wounding it, and then vanish back into the night. Struggling to keep up, the killer now moves in order to satisfy his voracious appetite. It's at first light the sheep farmer will realize the magnitude of the carnage. He may find as many as 10 to 15 sheep slaughtered that night. But only one will be found to have been eaten. The rest were just simply victims of the predator's thirst for blood. So who is this beast, you may wonder? Well, his name is Canis Lupus Linnaeus, or to the common man or woman, the wolf. The wolf. Perhaps no animal has captured the imagination of humankind like the wolf. The wolf has permeated the minds of people in legendary proportions. Folklore is full of stories about the wolf. Folklore has contributed greatly to the wolf's bad reputation. In many old sayings, the animal is a symbol of evil, of badness. For example... You may have heard the phrase to keep the wolf from the door means to prevent hunger or poverty. Or maybe you've heard about a wolf in sheep's clothing. It describes a person who acts friendly but has evil intentions. Again, I warn you, never be taken by good personalities. Fables and other folk tales, they pass on the misleading notion that wolves attack people. In the story of Little Red Riding Hood, a wolf threatens to eat a little girl. The wolf's bad reputation is not without foundation, though. Former U.S. President Teddy or Theodore Roosevelt once called the wolf the beast of waste and desolation. And this statement was a result of observing the seemingly senseless slaughter of sheep by wolves. Why, you might wonder, do they kill so much more than they can eat? Where wolves hunt and kill Many different animals, they, uh, such as uh, they, they kill and eat deer and uh, moose and uh, caribou and birds and rabbits and sheep and, and even mice. But sheep, it's interesting, sheep are the only animals that wolves just slaughter. Apparently, it's a compulsion of theirs. And they do it in, in just obscene numbers. What makes this more compelling is that wolves are extremely intelligent hunters. Extremely intelligent hunters. They're not marauders. There is just simply something about the sheep that causes the wolf's thirst for blood to be voracious. Sometimes wolves will slowly herd larger prey towards 
frozen lakes or, or, uh, or rivers or, or, or water or maybe loose snow. The purpose, of course, instinctively is to make footing and balancing treacherous for the prey. And in this vulnerable state, the animal can be attacked from different directions and be unable to protect itself, attack it from all different directions. <clears throat> Wolves can literally run all night long. Their endurance is unbelievable. They can wear down their resistant prey by following at a constant distance, adjusting to the animal's speed until exhaustion sets in. They're waiting for their moment to strike. Even strong animals that are not without defense against the wolf will eventually succumb to the relentless pursuit by the wolf. As the old saying goes, fatigue makes cowards out of strong men. The same is true in the animal kingdom. Hunters that have encountered the wolf are often struck by the intelligence that is communicated in the eyes of the wolf. It's been said a wolf takes your stare and turns it back on you. The Bella Coola Indians believe that someone tried to change all the animals into men, but succeeded in making human only the eyes of the wolf. The deadly stare of the wolf has made cowards of many, many brave people. Now, in spite of their savage reputation, wolves are intelligent. They're very intelligent creatures, not to be underestimated. As the animals go, they are playful protective parents to their young. They will kill many animals for food, but for some unknown reason, again, sheep, they just slaughter compulsively. Yeshua said that he would build his kehilat and the gates of hell would not prevail over it. Yeshua, along with other inspired writers of the Tevei HaShachim, called believers in Yeshua, what, the flock. They call it the flock of God. Notice Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Have no fear, little flock, for your father has resolved to give you the kingdom. And in Yochanan and John chapter 10, Yeshua says that he is the true shepherd of his flock. And then unlike a hireling paid to oversee the flock, he will not flee when danger comes, but protect the flock, even risking his own life for them. And if you continue reading in verses 11 to 13, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he isn't a shepherd and the sheep aren't his own, sees the wolf coming, abandons the sheep, and he runs away. But then the wolf drags them off and scatters them. The hired worker behaves like this because that's all he is. He's just a hired worker, so it doesn't matter to him what happens to the sheep. Now, the Talmud, Kepha, or Peter, instructed those that God had made under shepherds of the Messiah to shepherd the flock of God that is in your care. And out of all the animals in the animal kingdom, God inspired his followers to be likened to sheep. And like real sheep, the flock of God has formed formidable enemies also. These enemies of the Kehilat are called different things, but when likened to the animal kingdom, they are referred to as ravenous wolves. Notice Yeshua's warning in Matthew 7, 15. Beware of the false prophets. They come to you wearing sheep's clothing, but underneath they are just hungry wolves. But my message this morning consists of words from two different Pauls, two different aspects of the Apostle Paul, or Rabbi Shaul, one who warns us and one who worships with us. The first Paul, Rabbi Shaul, is warning the synagogue at Ephesus. Shaul had stayed at Ephesus for about three years, and he was teaching the true doctrines of the faith. And after being compelled to travel to Rushalayim to answer the accusations that he was teaching against the Torah, before departing, he leaves this final admonition for the congregation, his parting words. And we read those in Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 31. And he says to this congregation, he says, listen, watch out for yourselves 
And for all the flock in which the Ruach HaKodesh has placed you as leaders to shepherd God's messianic community, which he won for himself at the cost of his son's own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and they won't spare the flock. Even from among your own number, men will arise and teach perversions of the truth in order to drag away the Talmudin after themselves. So stay alert. Stay alert. Remember that for three years, night and day, says Shaul, with tears in my eyes, I never stopped warning you. So what do you think? What do you think? After Shaul left, do you think they heeded his warnings? Do you think they heeded them enough to avoid being overtaken by these savage wolves? Well, the scriptures reveal that years later, false teaching had actually become a major issue in Ephesus. Shaul then urged Timothy to slow the flow of erroneous doctrines being taught there. He wrote him a letter, and he said, as I counseled you when I was leaving for Macedonia, stay on in Ephesus so that you may order certain people who are teaching a different doctrine to stop. Obviously, Ephesus was having problems with men among them teaching a different perverse doctrine. So following his resurrection or ascension, Yeshua revealed through Yochanan this revelation to Ephesus in Revelation 2, verses 4 to 5. He said the following, But I have this against you. You have lost the love you had at first. Therefore, remember where you were before you fell. Turn from this sin and do what you used to do before. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your menorah from its place if you don't turn from your sin. And this letter was actually sent to Ephesus about 30 years after Shaul commissioned Timothy to correct their faulty beliefs. 30 years. But the group had lost its first love, sadly. They no longer had the deep devotion and commitment for the true doctrines of the faith. Yeshua warned that if they would not repent and recapture their first love, he would remove his light, the menorah, his presence from them. So what do you think? What do you think it is that brought them to this point 30 years later that Yeshua had to admonish them? Well, it's false teachers. Self-deceived false teachers that believed in what they were teaching. And the congregation blindly believed their deceptions. These, as scripture describes them, savage wolves that had succeeded in separating the flock from the shepherd, Yeshua. They did it through deception, and they did it through false teachings. And they had crept in unnoticed by the flock, and the flock had not heeded Paul's admonition to be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. And that doesn't just apply on a congregational level, that, that applies in a body level the body of Messiah level. Don't look at it just in a congregational setting, but look at it in a macro level as the body of Messiah. And of course, this had saddened Rabbi Shaul because he had lived there and taught for three years. When wolves get into positions of visibility in the kehilat or in the body as a whole, they do what comes natural to them. And it's not always a conscious thing. It's just the spirit that's within them. They divide the flock from its true shepherd. Again, in Paul's first letter to Corinth, uh, chapter one, the brethren were rallying around certain religious leaders. And uh, some were saying, oh, I'm, I'm a, uh, I follow Paul and, uh, and I'm with Peter. I listen to Peter. And others said, well, I'm of Apollos. And now all these men were godly men. And they were true servants of God, but Paul told them that by doing this, they were acting as carnal men. You have to understand, in the context of what we're talking about, most wolves, most wolves don't even realize that they're wolves. 
They don't realize it. it. They don't see themselves as wolves. They're so convinced. They are so convinced in their spirit and their deception that they are right. And nothing else matters but that. Self-deceive themselves. They do the work of their real master. And that's Hasatan. And the work of the Hasatan, of course, is not to unite the flock. The work of Hasatan is to divide, to scatter the flock from the true shepherd. Wolves are false teachers, false prophets that try to entice the sheep to follow them in order to, to lead them ultimately to spiritual slaughter. Again, wolves usually don't know that they're wolves. They don't think what they're doing is there's nothing wrong with it. They're very self-righteous, very sanctimonious, very sure of themselves. But they don't realize that they are instruments of Hasatan. And of course, for our reference point, their fruits are not of the spirit. Their fruits are of a different spirit, and they tell the tale. Remember Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 says, they come in sheep's clothing. And if you read verse 16, Yeshua tells that we will know them by their fruits. And they may look and sound good. They may look and sound good. Turn on your TVs and look online and look at the internet. They all look and sound good. They're all articulate. They're all excellent on the platform. They all have profitable ministries. They all have numerous followers and people who are smitten with them. Um, but their teaching will hold up when it's carefully examined by the scriptures. Is it in line with the teaching of Yeshua? or the Talmudim and the prophets. It's our responsibility, brothers and sisters, to test. To test those who come to us in the name and authority of Messiah to see if what they are saying is right and if it's true. And they may come to us from other congregations. They may come to us uh, at conferences. They may come to us on TV. They may come to us online. But they come to us nonetheless. We can't avoid them. Yeshua also warned that many would come in his name. Sincerity, sincerity matters little because many false teachers are unaware that what they're teaching has error. They don't know it. They sincerely believe what they believe. And you have to understand that. And we are so taken by sweet smiles and good people skills and opulence and prosperity and well-dressed and well-mannered that we lose sight of what is being construed or, or, or not construed, but really being communicated might be a bit flawed or might not line up scripturally. Many preach and teach, brothers and sisters, only what they've been taught from childhood. I'll bet most of you here were raised as believers. I will bet that. Yeah, I know, Katie, there's some that aren't. <laughs> but most of us that are here were raised. I'm not, I wasn't, but most of you were. And so you would be gravitating towards something that is familiar to you, something you've heard since you were a child. And you probably might even support it to this day. Many of you have one foot in the church and one foot here. That's your choice, but that's what we gravitate towards. Most ministers will preach the beliefs they were raised to believe. It's just that simple. If one was raised in the Baptist faith, what are they going to do? They're probably, if they feel called, they're going to attend a Baptist school of theology or seminary or Bible school in order to receive training and subsequent ordination, won't they? Sure they will. And most Christian denominations have colleges to train their ministerial force for service in their particular churches. Very few men indeed ever really studied themselves approved by God's word alone. That's why congregations like ours exist because we basically are kind of a thorn in the flesh. 
we kind of poke, you know, poke theologies a little bit in a very subtle way because there's some obvious differences to what we do. But their doctrines and beliefs are established and improved by their denomination that they will be employed by before their ordination into ministry. Once in, they're required. They're required to teach the doctrine set forth that they are to remain in good standing and employed because it is an occupation for them. So consequently, there is little incentive to put their doctrines to test against God's word. Many others become not only denominational, but they become disciples of movements. They become disciples of movements and the men and women that lead them, replicating then their manner of ministry. There's a lot of copycat ministries out there. They're just doing what they deem to be successful because they want success, as they understand it in a worldly sense, So when they see hundreds and thousands of people attending a particular congregation, then they look at it and go, well, that formula works. I think I'll incorporate that formula. Many of you don't realize, don't realize that that what you're seeing today is a result of what took place in the 70s and the 80s and came to fruition in the 90s. a lot of your mainline churches were struggling. They're struggling in numbers and still struggle this day. So then they, you know, there would be conferences and these men and women of God would get together and go, what are we to do? What are we to do to get people in the doors? What are we to do to keep people in the seats? Well, we got to change the message. We got to make it positive and uplifting. We have to be encouraging. We have to even go so far as to promise prosperity if you, if you live a certain way or do a certain thing. Let's keep it positive. Let's avoid anything about repentance, sin. We don't want anything like that. God is a God of love and grace and peace. It passes all understanding. And that has been an intentional point of view. Let's get the young people in because the future of the congregations are going to depend upon the young people. And what's going to attract the young people? Well, they're impressed with media. So we need to have lots of media. We need to have fog machines. We need to have hip clothes. We need to have amazing music. We need to entertain them. We need to make it comfortable for them. And so what do you have today? Do you hear messages about sin? Do you hear... You hear messages about you need to receive Yeshua, don't you? They are all preaching, receive Jesus. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. Well, yes, you do. But they leave out one important part of that equation, which is you've got to repent first. You've got to repent of your sin first. That doesn't preach. That doesn't fill. And that's why you have today in the 90s and beyond, you have these mega congregations. I know because I went to school for this. I was taught these very things. These kinds of formulas became the mainstay of most of your Bible colleges and seminaries. They want to know when they leave school how their congregation could be successful and prosper. And they brought in such church growth people that could teach you how to do that. And so it became a business. And so people like George Barna wrote books about how to Manage your ministry like a business. It was intentional, and everybody followed suit. And if you talk to any pastor, they will affirm everything that I just said because they've heard it themselves in their own particular denominations or movements. That is what's happening. There's the, the, the concern is less about lining up with God's word. The concern is less about about uh, ch- you know, challenging their doctrines and their points of view in regards to the word. Yeshua is the true shepherd. Yeshua is the shepherd. Yeshua is the role model. He is the way. He is the life. He is the truth. Notice he says that in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one's going to come to the Father but through me. God the Father has opened the door for humankind 
to have a personal relationship with him, but there's only one way to achieve it, and that is through Yeshua, not Torah alone, as some will tell you. And let me emphasize, it has to be the Yeshua of the Torah. It has to be the Yeshua of the Word, not the Yeshua of the church. And I'll beat that drum to my last breath. They are not the same. They are not. There's only one way to life eternal, and that is through Yeshua. And there's only one way to abide with the true shepherd, and that is not to stray from the truth, because he is the truth. The true doctrines of the faith teach us how to honor God and love our fellow man. Remember, it was the perverse things that were being taught in Ephesus that caused the followers to lose their first love. And I'm sure these teachings did not sound at the time perverse to them, but they did not match up. They didn't line up with the word or example that God had given in Scripture. And note that Timothy was sent to rebuke those false teachers with the pure word from the Holy Scripture. Yeshua also referred to the hirelings in the flock. He calls them thieves. He calls them robbers. I'll tell you what, there's some real money that's made in ministry. Real money. But notice in verse 10 of John chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy and I came that they may have life and might have it abundantly. So just what do these agents of Hasatan want to rob us of? They want our money? Well, maybe. But the, I'm talking about the spirit. I'm not talking about the intent. I'm talking about the spirit behind it. What are they really attempting to steal? What, are, what is it that they want? The target is your eternal inheritance. Your eternal life in God's kingdom, that's the target from Hasatan. To remove you from him in whom is the resurrection and the life. And once this is accomplished, here easy pray for him. Your easy pray. Notice, notice that in the second letter from Kephar, Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. But among the people, there were also false prophets, just as there will be false teachers among you. And under false pretenses, they will introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, and thus bring on themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their debaucheries, and because of them, their true way will be maligned. In their greed, they will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their punishment decreed long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. Peter is warning them of the infiltration of false teachers. And once in positions of leadership in whatever congregation it is, these teachers would introduce false doctrines designed to deceive you on the truth of the Messiah. The many that would embrace these teachings would eventually think the evil, that evil is truth and truth is evil. Peter said these wolves in sheep's clothing would be driven by greed. Maybe not intentionally, maybe not intentionally, but the spirit of these men is to rob and steal and kill your relationship with Yeshua. That's what's going on. To scatter the flock from the true shepherd and his protection. Because he knows the sheep are safe as long as they abide in Messiah. When you draw near to the Lord, he'll draw near to you. So they know that you're protected. But that's the very thing he covets. He covets your soul. He covets the people of God. He is greedy for the flock of God. He's not looking to consume me. He's looking to slaughter you like the wolf. He wants what belongs to God and his son Yeshua. So Paul and Peter and Jude warned us. They warned us over and over of savage wolves. Dear friends, I, I was busily at work writing to you about the salvation we share when I found it necessary to write, urging you to keep contending earnestly for the faith, which was once and all for all passed on to God's people. For certain individuals, the ones written about long ago, as being meant for this condemnation, have wormed their way in. Ungodly people who pervert God's grace into a license for debauchery and dishonor our only master and Lord, Yeshua the Messiah. And, and let me tag on to that. 
You won't find people renouncing generally Yeshua. They won't renounce him. They'll just reinvent him. That's the, that's the deception. There's no renouncing of Jesus. You just, re, you just reinvent him. You recreate him. That's where, where the elect is deceived. Yeshua said through John in Revelation 2, 2, I know what you have been doing, how hard you have worked, how you have persevered, and how you can't stand wicked peoples. So you tested those who call themselves em- emissaries, but aren't. And you found them to be liars. So why am I telling you all this? <laughs> why am I telling you all this? Why is this warning by Shaul so important this morning? I'll tell you why, because several times over our past 24 years when the site was thriving and growing, when we were at our best seasons as far as the Spirit of God moving and the numbers and we were prospering as a congregation, savage wolves again wormed their way into our congregation to teach perversions of the truth in order to drag away the Talmudim after themselves. That's scripture. Any one of these attacks would have meant the demise of most young congregations like ours. And yet, regardless of the enemy's countless efforts to fleece this flock, as far as God was concerned, that would, be, would not be the end of the story for us. I want to take you back about 14 years. Some of you might, oh, I don't know if anybody was here 14 years ago. Not even you. You weren't here. I'm trying to think. I don't think anybody was here 14 years ago. No? Mm, You were. You and David were. While we were settled in Oakwood Square Plaza, in the corner of the plaza, we put a lot of time and effort into that space in the corner. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful space. Freshly carpeted, beautiful stage that David built, bathrooms, we put a lot of time and effort into that space, and it, it was wonderful. And at that time, Hashem gave me a vision to host a one-day Messianic conference called Aliyah, which took place Saturday, July 9, 2008. The event was bittersweet, having just found out that the new owner of the plaza was not renewing our lease having rented our space out from under us that had been our home for five years to a dance studio because the ceilings were high and it was good for the batons to toss them into the air. And at that moment, we had no idea. We had no idea where we were going or how we would end up. Of course, we know we ended up at the end of the plaza in a new space. But at that moment, we had no idea. We didn't know. But our conference was hosted by Rabbi Tony Arroyo, who we flew up, him and his daughter, from Gainesville, Florida, and he led an afternoon dance workshop. While many of you know Rabbi Eric Lakatis of Tikvat Israel, he came and he did a teaching session simultaneously in another room. The climax of the conference that day was an outdoor concert we put on featuring Paul Wilbur, with the site worship team as the opener. And towards the end of his concert, with over 400 people in attendance, Paul invited me up to express his thanks for the invite because he'd been blowing me off for years. (laughs) So he finally finally agreed to come. You know, I wasn't one of the big guns in the movement. He had low expectations for his visit visit to Canton. Should have seen the look in his eyes at the end of that conference with all his product was sold. We cleared his table. He couldn't believe it. We had 400 plus people out there. And so he invited me up to give thanks. And, and then he wanted to pray over the star. And as he was praying, the Ruach HaKodesh spirit of God moved upon Paul to give us this prophetic word, which I saved all these years. Do you want to hear it? This is Paul Wilbur speaking to the star in the east that day in July 2008. A cloud is moving, so gather up your families. 
gather your tents. And I will take you to a land that flows with milk and honey. I will chase out the giants that stand before you because I am Yahweh the Lord. I will lead you by a way you don't know and paths where your feet have never been. And I will trample down the high places. I will raise up the low places for you and I take you in a way that is prepared for you. So do not look behind. Do not grieve. Do not be concerned for the days ahead. For even as I have led Moshe through the desert, I will lead you. And if I need water, if need be, water will spring from the rock and bread will appear at your feet. And I will be a cloud to shield you by day and a pillar of fire to warm and lead you by night. Only be careful to do all that I have said to you. Take no concern for tomorrow. What shall we fear? What shall we eat? For it is not written on the day that you call, I, Yahweh the Lord, will answer and say to you, here I am. So call on me now, and I will say in your hearing, here I am, he name me. Do not look to the left, do not look to the right, and do not consider the thoughts that come to steal your joy in the night hours, but blessed is the man who puts his trust in me. For have I not said I have prepared for you a future and a hope, plans for good and not for evil, and so you put your trust in me as you have, and I will lead you out, and I will make your life a testimony a covenant for the people. And you will know that it is I who have done this for you because of my love, because I am faithful. And I prove myself generation after generation. So gather up the little ones and pull up the tent pegs. For the cloud is moving to bring you into a place that is prepared, a place of abundance, a place of provision, a place of sacrifice, and a place of joy, a place of outpouring, a place of plenty. And others will look and see, and they will say, look at what Yahweh the Lord has done for them. Take your staff in your hand, take your cloak in the other, take up your tent for the cloud is moving. So here we are. Here we are at the place that God had prepared for us. A place of abundance. A place of provision. A place of sacrifice. And a place of joy. A place of outpouring. And a place of plenty. Looking back, we have we've learned. We've learned from our past how dangerous wolves can be, which is why we now have strong, vigilant watchmen over this flock to keep us secure. God's glory has never left us, but has brought us to where we are at today. The wolf failed. He failed to wear us down. He failed to wear us down, we stayed close, and we chased him away because we had the ram. We had the ram. Now with strong leadership, we are poised to follow Yeshua's way into what will be our future as a congregation. But we've learned, we've learned how vulnerable we can be. But hopefully we are much more discerning of he who comes as a thief to fleece the flock. No longer do we look behind. From this day on, what has passed away, and now all things are new as we follow his glory into our future. Please rise. The prophecy of the Lord bestowed upon Paul Wilbur is being realized. So, brothers and sisters, let's ready ourselves for the most blessed chapters yet written of this ministry. Let's pray. Let's pray. 
Father, we have always had a tremendous passion to be expositors of your word, the truth of your word, that we have made ourselves vulnerable even at times in being vigilant to your word. Some, we've seen many of our brothers and sisters throughout the years sacrificed to wolves by wandering too far in the shadows and in distant places theologically. But Father, your glory never left us. And your purposes for this congregation, Star and East, will continue to be realized regardless of the efforts of Hasatan. We stand vigilant, we stand strong. You've brought us wise men to lead this congregation, to serve this congregation, to protect this congregation, to be the watchman on the wall. And so we move confidently, not looking behind, as the prophecy declared. Those days are gone. The future is before us. We have the resources. We enter in no longer transient, but Father, we enter into the promise to utilize this resource for your glory and your purpose. May we never grow slothful, comfortable. May we never, Father, compromise your truth for convenience or prosperity. But Father, may we be sacrificial in all that we do for the sake of the kingdom and Yeshua's purposes. Father, may we be bold. May we be brave. May we be confident. And know, Father, there's no reason to fear for you have always been with us and will continue to be so. B'Shem Yeshua Adonai in the congregation says, Yivarek Yahweh Eva Yishmarecha Sadonai Panavalecha Vichonecha Sadonai Panavalecha Vesimlecha Shalom the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord to lift his counts upon you and that he would grant you his peace. B'Shem Yeshua Adonai. And the congregation agrees. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah.